Okay, so we're going to be changing the theme now, Simon, and we're going to move on now to start looking at how social media can be used in the mobile context. Um, and we've got several different speakers going to be picking up on different themes on that. But we're going to kick off with um, with Justin Wheeler from, from USAR. Uh, so please welcome Justin. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. So I'd like to kick off by just making a bold statement about mobile research. We're here in Chicago. We're going to be here for a couple of days. Of course, we're all here to learn about mobile research, and then from us on the supplier and vendor side, we like to pat ourselves on the back and talk about how great mobile research is, and it's part of our job, and we have to sell this. But we actually are very interested at USAMP in really learning um, some of the nuances about mobile research and why we actually end up seeing some slightly different responses from online research compared to mobile research. And we actually have a bold theory here, that you are more likely to get honest responses from consumers on a mobile device than you are from a computer. And we have a theory as to why that's true. Having conducted several hundred mobile research projects and compared them, comparing them to online research projects over the last couple of years, we have seen differences in answers. And we're very curious as to why that will occur for certain question types. That's me. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about some prior research that's been done related to mobile as a research mode. And a lot of that has been presented here at MRMW at shows in the past. So AOL presented, some exercises are more accurate on mobile. For example, ranking exercises where people are asked to drag items from one side to another side of a screen. And the five items on the left side are clearly of different sizes. They started with something as small as a tennis ball, and then went all the way to the size of something, the size of the moon. And 99% of people who did it on a mobile device using their finger accurately ranked the five items. Only 91% of people who did it on a computer using a mouse ranked it accurately. So this was an example of looking at mobile as, a, as the platform itself, the actual device interaction and experience, because of the nuance and the cognitive effort that it takes to grab it with your finger and move it over, you're more accurate in ranking five items that are obviously uh, of different sizes. And then mobile response quality was at least as good as the desktop or the laptop for certain other question types. For example, single select and multi-select lists. Side-by-side -side comparison. And AOL presented this research at ARF if you didn't attend that this year. Uh, last year, here at uh, MRMW and MRMW in Europe, Millward Brown and OnDevice co-presented a study that stated that mobile data quality is actually superior to face-to-face -face interviews when they compared it for brand tracking. And this was brand tracking in the sense of brand affinity as it compared over time to actual product experience in the marketplace. And the reason that they came out with is that mobile respondents are not influenced by the interviewer. So these were at the front of a store in, in uh, different countries around the world, literally at the front of a store, asking people about their brand affinity, and then, over time, tracking what people actually ended up purchasing. Mobile was more reflective in terms of what they stated on their device as compared to the face-to-face -face interviews that they conducted in the very same week. And USAM last year presented studies here at MRMW Mobile in contact respondents exhibit better recall of ads seen during a shopping experience when asked immediately on exit. Much higher ability to recall the ads that they were exposed to than respondents who uh, were being asked online later after the shopping experience. And mobile in contact respondents are far more confident about their accuracy of, of their answers about their shopping experience. What ads they saw, what brands they saw, products that they almost bought and chose not to. Far more confident in being able to tell you about those brands, leveraging mobile in context, as opposed to being asked the next day or even that evening in an online survey. So for this study, we engaged a partner, uh, Dr. Paul Lavrakis, PhD. And if you don't know Paul, this is him. He's retired and fishing on Lake Mead right now. But we engage him a couple of times a year to help us do research projects like this. Um, Paul is the former chief methodologist at Nielsen internationally. Uh, he's a professor from Ohio State University in Northwestern. And he's a voluntary research partner. We do not pay him. 
He's very interested in studying the ability of respondents to tell you the truth in context through a mobile device as compared to later online uh, in their ability to actually tell you what they think. So a little bit about this study. Mobile in context respondents are less likely to exhibit satisficing and social desirability bias uh, in their survey responses compared to online, out of context respondents. And I want to be very clear here. When we're saying online respondents, we are very specifically talking about people who are not in context. In other words, they are being asked when they're at home, in their living room, as opposed to people who are being asked in the environment where they are close to that moment of truth, about to make a purchase, for example, in a store. Does anyone know what this is? Satisficing? Is this a phrase people are familiar with? I had to look this up on Wikipedia. A cognitive heuristic whereby respondents perform the least amount of mental work possible to find a reasonable, good enough answer. That is satisficing. And this is on Wikipedia uh, for those of you who, uh, who want to go check it out. So, satisficing is what people do when they're being asked to take a survey and they're taking it on their desktop at home or on their tablet or even on their mobile device but sitting on their couch. And we're asking them questions about perhaps something they need to recall. Um, Ryan brought up earlier today, uh, think about the last time you went shopping at CVS. Okay, that may have been within the last 10 or 15 days. And now, as a respondent, I am being asked to search my memory banks and think about it. Do you remember seeing a brand that was new to you? Okay, maybe I do, maybe I don't. But what respondents will do is they will merge together past experiences into a generalized overall response, as opposed to being able to tell you exactly what they think in the moment. So uh, this is a cognitive heuristic that we all do. It's inherent in our behavior. Uh, and I actually have uh, an example of, of why this occurs, and it's something that we can all uh, very much personally relate to. I was having a conversation with a colleague this morning, and I said, you know, it's actually kind of funny. Daniel Steele, the novelist, probably knows about the value, more about the value of mobile research than most of the people at this conference. And we kind of laughed about it, and I decided to actually read a, a quote that will prove that that's true. So this is Daniel Steele, novel, first sight. I think you can all probably get it at the airport on your way out of town. But I want to read a quote from this that tells you why this happens and why mobile helps to prevent this. As she entered the lobby, the memories of that day crashed over her like a wave, flooding her mind with images of him and feelings she couldn't suppress. Now, I can't read the rest of this because it's not PG. What did I do? <laughs> but I'm sure this is something we've all experienced. You've gone to a, a high school reunion. Um, you've gone somewhere that maybe was a, an anniversary spot for you and your spouse or significant other. Perhaps it was just seeing someone here at this conference and going, oh my god, remember that conversation we had last year that we never got back to? It hadn't occurred to you two weeks ago. It occurred to you when you saw them. So mobile respondents have the ability, because we can reach them in context, they have the ability to not uh, use as much satisfaction. Social desirability bias. Anyone know what this is? Social desirability bias? So again, our friends at Wikipedia, the tendency of respondents to provide the answer they believe that the interviewer wants to hear or that will make the respondent look better. So this is one we can probably test right now or show an example of as we speak. Um, people got into town yesterday, you had your pre-workshops where you just got into town. How many uh, alcoholic beverages did everyone have last night? How many want to cop to five? How many want to cop to four? If your boss was asking you this question, how would you answer that? Or your pastor? Or a highway patrol officer? So social desirability bias is, how do I want to be thought of when, at the end of this survey, or by the person who's asking me? Companionship. B, sex, or C, respect. I'd have to go with B, sex, but let's put C so we get a higher score, what do you think? So if you haven't seen this movie, this is from uh, a movie called Return to Me. It stars David Duchovny and, and uh, Bonnie Hunt. And she's got a friend who's in the hospital. They're taking a Cosmo survey. This is from Cosmopolitan Magazine. What do you most seek from a relationship? A, companionship. B, sex.
sex. C, respect. Well, I'd have to go with B, sex, but let answer, let's answer C so we get a higher score. How many have done that when you're taking a Cosmos survey? Right? So social desirability bias. So for our study, what we wanted to discover was during a dining experience, are mobile panelists less likely to engage in these two behaviors compared to online, out-of-context panelists who are engaged within seven days after that dining experience. So for the mobile panelists, we are talking to them after they've eaten, but before they leave the restaurant, and they have the check in their hand. So we're engaging them right at that table. They've gone to a casual dining restaurant. They're said, hey, uh, they're, they're asked, when you complete your dining experience, when you've been given your check, we want you to take this survey. And then we're asking the questions. For our comparative panel, these are online panelists, same restaurants, same demographic breakout, and we're asking them the question, for your last dining, ex dining experience within the past seven days, so we had to filter through several thousand panelists to get a groups of 300 within each group that paired up. So which survey setting ends up being more reliable? The traditional online, out of context, or the mobile in context where they are able to take that um, there. And just a quick note, we do have validation that these people were at the restaurant. And the way we do validation is twofold. Of course, it's uh, geo-validation and geofencing through the GPS. And then we also ask them to take photos. So um, this, these were mobile panelists who attempted to get to our screener and tell us that they had been available at, at one of these restaurants. And we said, we need a photo of something with the restaurant logo on it. And we get things like Red Lobster. Now, I haven't been to a Red Lobster in a long time. But I don't think that is the, I don't think that's So this is what we wanted. We wanted people to, you have to take a photo of at least one thing with the restaurant logo on it. Plus, we have the GPS signal. Plus, we have to have a photo of the receipt. So we know you were physically sitting there. And we know the time that they were on site. Minimum of 30 minutes before we would allow them to even engage. So, our research shows online respondents do exhibit what we expect. Satisficing and social desirability bias. Behaviors that are not exhibited by the in-context respondents. And again, we have a theory as to why that happens. But let's talk a little bit about some of this. So some of these satisfying behaviors by the online respondents, again, if you think of these, these uh, out-of-context respondents taking this maybe four or five days after they were at the restaurant, um, they are merging together several dining experiences at Red Lobsters and, and similar restaurants over the past many months. They are giving us the best answer they can, but they merge together. And so what we end up with is the Jerry Seinfeld diner experience, where they're just telling us about generalized dining experiences even if they're doing their best to remember what, they, uh, what happened. So as an example of some of this data, median number of total visits to that restaurant, our online respondents said somewhere between seven and eight, 7.21 was the total number of times they felt like they dined at that restaurant. When we asked the mobile in context respondents, it was 4.91. It's a significant difference in data. And this is the type of difference we have seen consistently for the last couple of years as we have been doing more and more mobile research projects. For certain questions, we tend to get an inflation because we're just asking a generalized number. And the satisficing rule in people's heads, this cognitive heuristic that they use, gives an answer that is sufficient to answer the survey question, and they feel like they've done enough. That's enough mental work to actually think about it. Because what we know from Danielle Steele, the mobile in-context respondents are physically sitting there where they have eaten many times. And they can probably actually recall all the other times that they were there. They can give you a much more accurate response. This is a significant difference in data when you're talking about these, these two groups. <laughs> Social desirability bias among respondents. So we asked a significant number of questions of these people in terms of what they did during their dining experience. Median number of minutes looking over the menu. Uh, mobile respondents, 2.76 minutes is what they told us they thought they did. And for online respondents, it was 3.62 minutes. Again, a significant difference. This is way outside margin of error. There is something going on there. In general, what people thought they do at casual dining restaurants is probably 3.62 minutes. But within 30 or 40 minutes after having done so, it's a much lower number. So we see significant differences between those in-context respondents and the later out-of-context respondents. 
Similarly, for social desirability bias, we asked a question about the mean number of people who dined with you. So how many people were in your party the last time you went out to the restaurant? And again, we see a difference. Mobile panelists, 2.24. Now they're just telling us how many people are sitting at the table. In fact, we often ask them for photos of this. Please tell us, you know, we want to see these people. 2.24 people, as opposed to online respondents, 2.44 people. Why? Social desirability. How do I want to be thought of by my friends and people who are asking me? Well, I want to be thought of as popular. I want to be thought of as cool, and cool people go out with more people because they're cool and everyone wants to hang out. Hindsight also tended to, to grade satisfaction, which is very interesting. Um, it's incongruous with the other two metrics that we saw. It's incongruous with eating there more often, which the out-of-context panelists told us, and it's, out of, uh, it's incongruous with the idea of eating there with more people. If I'm less satisfied, why would I eat there more often and with more people? So again, you can see here, uh, value for money, the noise lever, quality of food, um, quantity of food, types of choices, and many variety. Online panelists tend to be significantly less satisfied with their experience than the mobile in-context respondents who just had the experience within 25 minutes ago and we made sure they had the bill in their hand so they were feeling the pain of that dining experience right there. But you can see that over time, even though I felt great about my experience right when I had it, but now, over five or six days later, it starts to merge with other dining experiences I've had where I'm not feeling as good. Um, and we have had conversations about the fact that it's also possible that the online, out-of-contact respondents are not tipsy at the time they're taking the survey, whereas the mobile in-contact respondents might have had a couple of glasses of wine. Either way, they're feeling great about their experience as compared to the later uh, online respondents, where again, their historical data all gets merged in their head with several past experiences. We also saw uh, the very light, uh, barrier somewhat likely to return to that restaurant. Again, mobile respondents, 89% said yes, and uh, online respondents, top two, was 82%. So again, a, a significant difference here. So our conclusion is quite simple. In context mobile, produces less satisfying. And the reason that is, is those panelists, those consumers, have better access to those memories. They are available to them. Less social desirability bias seen in in-context respondents. And hindsight can alter my perceptions, especially with things like satisfaction. It degrades over time as compared to how I felt right when I experienced it. And this is a question that we get a lot. I want to, I want to wrap up with this. Does this mean that online panelists, meaning the online research that you guys are probably doing every day, are those respondents lying? And the answer is actually no. Even though you can get more truth out of a mobile in-context respondent, it doesn't mean that the online, out-of-context respondent a week later is lying to you. They're telling you the best truth they have available. Online respondents are as honest as they can be. Great. Mobile in-context respondents have better access to the truth, as we learned from Danielle Steele. They have better access to the feelings, they have better access to the memories, and they have better access to the experiences both that happened to them right then and that may have happened in their past visits to that same store, restaurant, or uh, event. I'll take questions. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. taken the time to compare these two approaches. I think we need more of that in research in general, in general to understand what we learn from our different methods in our toolkit. We agree. My question for you, though, <laughs> is around your conclusions. Uh, clearly, you see differences in what you learn in the mobile context and in the online context. But how do you know which one is actually accurate or which one we should really care about? It, this is a, it's a great question. Um, and clearly, in this particular study, we did not um, you know, validate in terms of what they spent and what they tipped and all the other questions that we asked. We do have a, a white paper that everyone, uh, anyone who wants it can please walk up to the USAM booth and ask for a little thumb drive. It has our white paper on this so you can see a little bit more detail about the research. 
But in this case, of course, we, we can't 100% validate these particular types of questions. It's not available to us to say, is that really the, the number of times that that person has been to that restaurant? Or um, how many minutes did they actually spend? Or did we have video cameras up there that we could look at it? And the answer is no, we didn't. Um, the, what's important here is that we see these differences consistently when we're comparing in-context research modes to offline out-of-context research modes. And you're absolutely right, a lot more research needs to be done both to validate the conclusions here, what we're seeing is the evidence of it, and the evidence of it is consistent. And it isn't specifically just you know, uh, studies like this. We also do it when we, we do things like product concept testing. So product concept testing for a CPG product. We actually see, if we're asking people whether or not they would purchase that product, and they are standing in the store, in front of the shelf, where that product would be if it actually existed, that we see lower intent to purchase consistently than we do with the exact parallel study to an online, out of context audience. Very consistent. Now, the work that's being done now is to track what actually happens, which mode is more predictive of actual product performance over time. So you're 100% correct. All of those steps need to happen. But again, what we're seeing here is there's a tremendous amount of smoke, and there must be some fire in me. Thank you very much. Right, for the purposes of time, I'm going to move us on.